if I can get through the day, I can take my daughter to the park here and then I can sneak away to my favorite part of the park, <laughs> uh, which is where the water is. And, you know, just kind of retool from the day and recenter on my family. I was diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia when I was 19 years old. It was a Spanish teacher at Howard University my first semester in school who noticed that I was falling asleep in class. There was no one who said, oh, you're in your late teens, early 20s, you need to start looking out for neurological disorders. We all experience spurts of more or less sleep. Many of us, after missing a lot of rest and feeling exhausted, will sleep for well more than the recommended seven or eight hours. After that, we feel more wakeful and ready to go about our lives. For people with idiopathic hypersomnia, or IH, that's not the case. Someone diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia sleeps for long periods of time, say 11 hours within a 24-hour period, but never wakes up feeling refreshed. I don't remember what a good night's sleep even feels like. Because people think they know what it feels like to dream or be really tired, people think they understand what we deal with, but they really have no clue. It's very frustrating for these patients. We give them these diagnoses that have no meaning. We know narcolepsy with cataplexy, which has a very clear cause. You know, it's a deficit in orexin and so forth. But for all this other problem, idiopathic hypersomnia, insomnia, we know this is complicated. It's not a single cause. A number of years ago, several of my colleagues came up with a hypothesis that potentially idiopathic hypersomnia was being caused by an endogenous substance that was turning on the activity of GABA A receptors. If you produce something that activates those receptors, it could potentially be sedating. It might cause the sleepiness of idiopathic hypersomnia. And there's a little bit of experimental evidence suggesting that idiopathic hypersomnia may have a circadian component to it as well. People with idiopathic hypersomnia often have a lot of difficulty waking up in the morning. They may be trying to wake up at a time that their circadian rhythm is telling their brain is still nighttime. What's hard for work is I'll have a like, dreamlike experience where I've woken up, I've brushed my teeth, I've had a shower, I've had breakfast, put clothes on, gotten ready for work, and then I wake up and realize I've been asleep the whole time. And then now I'm running late because, you know, I thought I was awake, but it was all a hallucination-like dream. If you don't sleep well, everything seems difficult to achieve. A typical issue is the ability in everyday life to integrate a lot of information. As we go about our daily lives, we receive a lot of information about our environments, maybe a new detour on the road to work, or a story in the news. That information causes our synapses, the sites where two nerve cells meet, to grow and exhibit learning. In mice, Chirelli showed that daily activities made their synapses grow and add receptors to the point that the synapses were saturated. Restful sleep reduced the size and strength of the synapses so that they were primed for more learning after waking up. Without that rest, the synapses remained saturated and learning was more difficult. Now we think that really the reason why the brain needs to be disconnected is indeed because Sleep does synaptic homeostasis. Sleep allows the weight, the strength of synapses in the brain to be renormalized. You end up at the end of the day having learned many things, but the price for this learning in cellular, in synaptic levels, is this increase in the strength, which is good, again, because it's a sign of learning, but in the long run, is actually not sustainable. One of the big questions about sleep is it's regulated by two things. One is what's called the sleep homeostat. It's basically how much sleep debt, sleep need you have. But the second thing that also regulates sleep, independently of the sleep debt, is circadian rhythm. Right now, the only way to measure circadian rhythm is to keep people in a dark room or at least constant dim light and measure melatonin. And it's very time consuming and it's not very precise. Now I'm very excited because I'm developing some new technology where I'm measuring some proteins, thousands of proteins, 7,500. And with these proteins, we can actually predict 
uh, the circadian rhythm and the sleep debt of patients. So I think it will really lead to a complete redefinition of the diagnosis of people who have idiopathic hypersomnia or insomnia. In the next two to five years, researchers believe such a technique could become a reality in diagnosing sleep disorders. In August, the FDA approved the first treatment for IH, a drug that was already approved to treat sleepiness and sudden loss of muscle tone in people with narcolepsy. Pinpointing the biological causes, diagnoses, and treatments of poorly understood sleep disorders could provide hope for those with mysterious cases. Having the diagnosis allows you some options, and the more options that are created that include rare disorders like IH, the more options people can have to live fuller lives. My daughter loves to climb this tree, but she's four, so she has to have a lot of support. And the last time we were here, I started to have a spell. I was getting really tired, and she really wanted to sit up there. I couldn't risk it. There are moments like that where you let people down. Uh, but you know you're doing the right thing.